Good morning, good afternoon and good evening again. A very warm welcome to this third and final session of the Narrative Shift in the Digital Age series. Today we'll be learning about shifting health narratives in Africa. I'm delighted to introduce you to senior fellow, storyteller and writer, Dr. Ifeani Ensafor, who will be presenting and facilitating the session. Ifeani is a public health physician and a leading voice in global health equity, health security, universal health coverage and health research. You may have seen him interviewed by some of the major news outlets, including Al Jazeera, the BBC, Channel News Asia, CCTV, Forbes and The Lancet, among others. He has authored and co-authored more than 100 opinion pieces and is published in a range of peer-reviewed journals. In 2020, he was named among the top 100 most influential Africans by the New African magazine. If I any welcome. It's an honour to have you leading this session today. Thank you and over to you. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thanks everyone for making our time to be part of this today. This session is just for me to share the ways that I've been countering dominant narratives about Africa. And of course, you know, there are just so many of those narratives about Africa. And I think we must correct them as we move along. One thing for me that is very clear is that the way social media has become something that we really need to tap into. I know that lots of people are scared of social media because of the negative aspect of social media. Well, there are lots of positives, and I like what a requirement says, that we don't have a choice on whether we do social media. The question is how well we do it. How do you adapt it to your own context, the work that you do, and even for amplifying yourself as a thought leader in the space that you work in? Recently, the Brunswick Group did a survey, interviewed about 3,000 people in different countries to gain their perception about social media and the use of it. 25% of employees prefer to work for a CEO who uses social media for disseminating information. And 86% of financial readers say it is important for business leaders to use social media to communicate. So for me, this particular Brunswick Group survey just shows that even people that we want to reach out to, whether for funding, for networking, for connecting in different ways, on social media, they are looking out for information and they want to hear from us. So I'm Nigerian and I'm based in Nigeria. Nigeria is the most populous Black nation on earth. And Nigerians are quite active on social media. Currently, we have about 41 million Nigerians on Facebook and 14 million on Instagram. Twitter is about 3 million. I like to use the Nigerians on Facebook as an example of the possibilities that exist. We have an estimated population of 200 million people. The largest state in Nigeria is Lagos State, about 22 million people. And the way I try to relate this Facebook population of Nigerians to my context is that if Nigerians on Facebook were a state in Nigeria, we will be the most popular state in the country. And it is very easy to target people with specific information that you want them to see. Social media holds so much possibilities for us, and we really need to be tapping into it. So how do I tell my stories? Primarily, I tell my stories through writing. In addition to being a senior Atlantic fellow, I'm also a senior New Voices fellow at the Aspen Institute. And that particular fellowship is to train development experts like myself from the global south so that we can amplify our voices at the global stage. Because as you know, the global north has had this monopoly of media and telling stories. So the New Voices Fellowship at the Aspen Institute is to try to correct that. I was selected a fellow in 2018, and that has been a game changer from the trainings that I received on writing, opinion pieces, telling my stories. So this organization, the Op-Ed Project, they are based in New York, and they were the group that taught my own cohort on writing opinion pieces. The Op-Ed Project is all about training people to write opinion pieces and through that to amplify their voices. I like this particular quote from their website, that whoever tells a story writes history. I think this is quite instructive because what it simply tells me is that no matter the kind of good work that you're doing, whatever it is that you're based, if you do not tell your stories, you don't get the kind of visibility that you deserve. It's almost as if you're not doing as much because funders, donors, partners, people who would like to partner with you in different ways may not get to hear about whatever it is that you're doing simply because you're not telling your stories and your stories are not being amplified, for instance, on social media, since that's what we're talking about today. For me, telling stories, whether it's writing op-eds or even on social media, is not all about big words. And again, this is a quote from the op-ed project. 
Jargon serves a purpose, but it is rarely useful in public debates and can obfuscate cloud your argument. Speak to your reader in straight talk. This is something that I've really benefited from, from that training by the OPED project. And of course, from writing opinion pieces over the past four years consistently, I've seen that people are not impressed by big words. Moreover, beyond people who are in your space, we want to get a lot more people to know about what we're doing. So nobody's really impressed by using these big words that people like us tend to use all the time. So speak to your reader in straight talk. We have all sorts of players on social media, all sorts of actors on social media that really need to hear and learn about the work that we do. So still on writing, which is the way that I tell my stories, I've written 104 opinion pieces. A number of them I've co-authored with colleagues, even some of the senior Atlantic fellows. I've co-authored some pieces with them. About 45 of these pieces are specifically on COVID-19. Close to 50% of the authors I've written are on COVID-19, different aspects of COVID-19, mainly on the equity part of it. And I'm really very grateful for the privilege that this presents to me because I've seen that my voice consistently is amplified. The work that I do is amplified from my authors and, of course, from amplifying them on social media myself. Let me just talk briefly about two authors that I've written for Project Syndicate and the kind of impact that they have made. Even apart from social media, writing opinion pieces obviously have their ways of amplifying your voice. In 2019, before COVID happened, I wrote two op-eds for Project Syndicate. One was making the most of the malaria vaccine, then the other one, why an Ebola vaccine is not enough. One of the reasons why I like Project Syndicate is not because they are quite influential, but because periodically they send you an impact report to show you the impact that your op-eds are making. And because they syndicate their pieces through different media outlets globally, your opinion piece is actually being read in probably up to 180 countries. So in 2019, not long after I published this piece, they sent me the impact reports on these two particular op-eds. Let me just read the overview for both. Making the most of malaria vaccine has appeared as of that 2019 in 18 publications in 15 countries, has been published in six languages, has appeared in more than 4.2 million print copies and has been seen over 41,000 times on the Project Syndicate social media channels. The other one, why an Ebola vaccine is not enough, had appeared in 18 publications in 16 countries, published in eight languages, appeared in more than 4.3 million print copies, and as at that time had been seen about 36,000 times across their social media channels. Anytime I look at this impact report, it's really quite humbling because it shows where these two opinion pieces had appeared 8.5 million times in print copies across so many countries. That just shows you the kind of reach that your opinion pieces will make. So one of the things I want people to take away from this is I really want a lot more development experts like ourselves to begin to write opinion pieces because they have benefits. I think it was on the first day of this narrative workshop where one of the speakers mentioned the fact that lots of what you see on social media are people ranting. People rant a lot on social media. And so what? What I've tried to articulate as some sort of formula is if you're posting on social media, what is the problem you're talking about? What solutions do you think there are to this problem? And what are the calls to action? And the call to action will depend on who it is that you're targeting with that particular post. For instance, a call to action that you expect people in government to do compared to donors or compared to communities would differ because these are different stakeholders. So that is the way I try to articulate even my opinion pieces as well as my social media posts. What is the problem? What are the solutions? Then what are the calls to action? Let me just share a bit about OPEZ recently and how I've used them to counter narratives on social media. My most recent OPED was published in NPR and it was on the monkeypox. Because I'd seen media outlets, especially in the West, writing about monkeypox outbreak in the West and using photos of black people with monkeypox blisters. And I was like, why? Why do you have to do that? Why are you dragging us into it? We know we are endemic for monkeypox. But then if you're going to write about monkeypox in the US or in Europe or in Australia, surely you can find a photo of a white person that has monkeypox to use. And if you think that's not ethical to do, then it's also not ethical to use the photos of black people with monkeypox. So I wrote that particular piece for NPR, and that has generated a lot of interest. In fact, today, somebody from the Associated Foreign Press reached out. She read this piece, and she wants to interview me tomorrow. And that, again, is the benefit of writing opinion pieces and amplifying them through social media. This particular one is about two weeks ago. Nigeria's accountant general, the civil servant that's in charge of our treasury, was accused of looting 80 billion naira, which is about $105 million. He's suspended and all. So what I try to do in this particular opinion piece is say, look, there are several things in the health sector that that 80 billion naira could provide for Nigerians. 
But beyond that, we cannot keep pushing against COVID-19 vaccine inequity when we have government officials looting so much money that we could have used to buy vaccines for Nigeria. So for me, this is a way, not just countering narrative, but also holding ourselves accountable as Nigerians, as Africans, that we must begin to plug the loopholes for illicit financial outflows out of the continent. And the data for that shows every year an estimated $50 billion lost through illicit financial outflows out of Africa. So we must stop corruption in Africa if we truly want to be independent of the global north in funding social services for our people. That particular piece I wrote for NPR on Bonky Parks Professor Gavin Yami, who is a professor of global health at Duke University, he tweeted about it, recommending it as essential reading. I responded to it and he went ahead to tweet, thank you for this piece. It will now be in my syllabus as a required reading for every course that I teach. For me, this is huge because what it means is that people in training for public health, global health in Duke University that pass through Professor Yame's class would at least get to see that it is not equitable for you to begin to color Africans as disease reading. You must know the right way to report this. Piece. Some of the unintended positive consequences of writing opinion pieces, of course, is other media outlets will pick it up and that leads to interviews most of the time, further amplifying your voice. Some of the opinion pieces I've written in the past have led to interviews on BBC, on Al Jazeera, and other media outlets. So what I do usually is that once I publish any opinion piece, I amplify it myself across all my social media platforms. I'm active on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, on TikTok, on LinkedIn. Those are the five social media platforms I'm very active on. So I amplify them myself, and I go ahead to boost this post and actually pay so that a lot more people will get to see them. Beyond the writing opinion pieces, I've also done lots of work in advocacy. Until November last year, I was working for Nigeria Health Watch as Director of Policy and Advocacy. I did lots of videos on advocacy, trying to engage people. But one thing that has really bothered me is we need to speak to our audience in plain language. I'd always been thinking, how do I start a series on social media videos less than one minute that will hit the nail on the head? No jargon, straight to the point, get experts like myself to address one particular issue that they are passionate about. I recorded the first one with Adekemi, the senior fellow in my cohort. So this one I've amplified already across my social media platforms, on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube, LinkedIn, across all those social media platforms that I'm active in. So let me just play it. It's less than a minute. Sugar is often seen as a culprit for holes in the tooth or what we call tooth decay. But that's not totally true. Sugar itself does not cause holes to come on the tooth, but it can contribute to it. But there are also different foods that, you know, can contribute to toothache, like carbonated drinks, like eye caps, foods that are high in eye caps. But you could also do with fruits and vegetables that are high in fibers, and that is good for your tooth. Also, the most important thing is brushing and flossing. Even without staying away from sugar and not brushing or flossing can still cause holes to form your tooth. So I would say brush well, floss well, and take care of your mouth and eat healthy. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Okay, so as I was saying, this is my way of trying to break down public health messaging because people that are not in public health or not in the development space, they don't understand so many of the jargon that we use all the time. So I just wanted to start a series where, you know, break down this information. I approach somebody within my network, one of the experts with them and say, okay, what would you want the public to know? What one thing? And talk with the person to package that information straight to the point. And this is something that Adekemi has done and she did it so well. I shared this video last night and I boosted it on Twitter. It has close to about 1,500 views already on Twitter. I've shared it across all my social media platforms, on Facebook, generating a lot of interest, people asking questions. This is something that I'm going to take forward. I want it to be a weekly series. I don't contract it out to anybody. I edit it myself and make sure that it captures the goal that I have in mind for breaking down public health messaging and getting a lot more people on social media to get engaged. Just briefly about more op-eds that I've written, I wrote another piece for NPR a few weeks back. This Netflix series, Young, Famous, and African, I watched it. And when I watched it, I was like, no, let's not have another Real Housewives kind of show. So what I did was to say, look, this show was about young Africans that are young and famous. What if I had an opportunity to redo this series or maybe do the second series of this particular Netflix series? What would I do? So I flipped it on the other side to get a lot more people engaged. Because one thing that we know is that entertainment is a very good vehicle for disseminating all sorts of information. So what I try to do is to use it to, as much as possible, disseminate public health messaging 
and address different equity issues. When vaccine nationalism started, I wrote a piece titled, Why Am I an Invisible Man in the Global Vaccine Campaign? This is me, again, trying to push against some of these narratives. When Europe last year decided to come up with a green pass that did not recognize Oxford AstraZeneca vaccines that people like us in the Global South took, despite the fact that the one manufactured in Europe and the UK were manufactured by the same manufacturer. It's just that the one that we're given in this part of the world was manufactured in India, but it's straight Oxford AstraZeneca. So I wrote a piece about that to push back against that. Another Netflix series, Blood Sisters, quite popular with Nigerians and across Africa. I watched this series and said, look, apart from the entertainment part of it, it highlighted gender-based violence. So I pointed out about five ways where gender-based violence occurred in the movie and provided solutions to gender-based violence in Nigeria as well as Africa. Last year, December, after the Omicron virus came up, South Africa reported it first. Several media outlets, Europe, in Thailand and Spain, started painting Omicron as an African virus. So for me, again, it was an opportunity. I don't know if you've noticed the pattern. I try to see what is it that is topical. Because something that is topical means that once you write about it, when people are searching for that topical issue, then your op-ed will come up. If you share it on social media, it will come up because you're going to tap into that hashtag to really make your voice heard. This piece for MPI is one that is very dear to me. After the death of Chadwick Boseman, the editor approached me to write a piece, a tribute to him. I really like this piece because for this piece, I drew a lot from my Nigerian heritage. I'm an Igbo man from Nigeria. To say that a great tree has fallen, because we have a saying like that in Igbo land. But even after the tree has fallen, it doesn't die because as long as it's on the ground, it sprouts roots and the tree lives on forever. That was my tribute to Chadwick Bosman, but it was also an opportunity for me to bring in advocacy for colon cancer, which was what killed Chadwick Bosman. So I can write about anything, but most importantly for me, I'll bring in global health as part of it. I'll find a way of bringing global health, or at least to counter any particular narrative that I'm not happy with. This piece for the conversation, I co-authored one of my friends, Maru Momina. She works at the Ethox Center at Oxford. What developing countries can teach rich countries about responding to pandemics? And we wrote this in 2021 because what you keep hearing is that, look, Africa, the global south, they're not doing But it's not true because even WHO did an assessment last year to say that out of all the continents, Africa had the most coordinated response to COVID-19. And for me, as a Nigerian, as an African, I have to find ways of consistently challenging these narratives and telling our own stories. Because if we don't, nobody will tell the stories for us. And even when they tell the stories, the stories may be embellished and will not be told the right way. And remember that quote from the op project, whoever tells story writes history. So if we want to be part of history making, we have to really tell our stories, whether we're writing op or we're using social media to amplify the work that we do. So anytime I write an opinion piece, once it's published, I amplify it myself on social media. Apart from just sharing on social media, I also pay to boost. Anytime I talk about paying to boost, people think it's a lot of money. No, you can boost for as low as $1 a day. (laughs) I usually boost for like one week, seven days, and reach millions of people simply because I put some money behind it. If I made that post about my different op-eds and I don't boost them, a lot of people will read them quite all right, but not as much as if I put some money behind boosting this post. Also, writing op-eds and having them published by different media outlets, they also help you amplify it because they share it across their own social media platforms. NPR, for instance, has 8.9 million followers on Twitter. Scientific American, 4 million. All Africa, 464,000. Project Syndicate, 223,000. The Africa Report, 219,000. So apart from me amplifying my writing on social media, Just having those opinion pieces published by these different outlets, they also amplify themselves. So you can imagine anytime I write a piece for NPR and they just tweet about it, it's going to be delivered to 8.9 million people. I don't know how many of them that will click on it and read it and hopefully take actions. In summary, I really want to see a lot more development experts, a lot more senior Atlantic fellows to be thought leaders, to write opinion pieces, but also to use social media. Because it's such a huge opportunity globally, close to 3 billion people on one social media or another. So that's a huge population. Of course, by country, you can find out the different populations where you're based that are on different social media platforms. Because again, going back to what Project Syndicate says, whoever tells the story writes history. And that really helps us amplify our voices and hopefully find more fulfillment in the work that we do, get more recognition, as a result, get more funding, And it becomes like a positive cycle. The more we write, the more we amplify on social media, 
the more that we're known, the more that the work that we do gets to different people that otherwise may not hear about the things that we do simply because we amplify them on social media. Thanks, Ifeani. You're really high profile, well known. So now submitting articles to different publications, people, they'll recognise your name. When you were starting out, Mm. like many of us here will be, how do you catch the attention of these publications? How did you get to where you are now? Like I said, my cohort was trained by the Op-Ed Project. And part of the Aspen New Voices, for your first year of fellowship, you get a lot of mentoring. In fact, a mentor is attached to you to help you go through your pieces so that before you pitch to the editor, at least it's in a state that the editors will get to look at your piece. To be honest, 2018, I only succeeded in publishing three pieces, three. And it was quite demoralizing. But the game changer for me was when I looked at other senior fellows at the Aspen Institute, one particular one actually caught my attention. She's Professor Esther Ngumbi. She's from Kenya. But she's also a professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana in food security. At that time, she had written more than 100 opinion pieces. And even before I was selected, I had read her journey and all. So I reached out to her. It was like that hand-holding process with somebody who is a fellow, a senior fellow like yourself, that understands all the challenges that you went through. So I co-authored two or three pieces with her. And that process really helped me because, one, it built my confidence. I started writing and it's almost like I took wings and started flying. One other thing that I learned from Esther was that, look, you have to keep writing. You just have to find the energy to keep writing or else you lose that writing ability. And moreover, you don't have so many pieces because when I pitch to editors, of course, I make references to places that are published, that the articles are written so that it's okay. Ah, okay, this is an important person. But having said that, even up to now, I get rejection. I pitch to editors and they say, well, okay, it's a wonderful article. It's great and all, but for different reasons, we don't want to publish it now. Initially, that used to make me feel so bad. But again, what Esther told me was that, look, if I, every piece you write will find a home. When you pitch it to an editor and they say, no, forget about it, thank them for the opportunity, get the next editor and pitch to the editor. What I even tell people now in addition is when you pitch to several editors and they're not accepting it, one of the largest publishing platforms that is open source is Medium. Open a Medium account. I have a Medium account. I've published a number of articles there myself. So once I pitch to several editors and I'm getting rejections and I'm just tired of all the pitching, I'll publish it on Medium and move on. Because I know that once it's out there online, I can use social media to amplify it and reach more people. In your address book or on Speed Dial or whatever, do you have all the editors now? Yeah. So again, this is also part of the privilege of being a senior fellow. We were sent contacts of different editors. Some of them have moved on from one publication to another. But at least I have emails of editors. And because I've written a lot for different outlets, what I see happen now is that some editors also reach out to me if something is happening. Like this article I wrote on monkeypox. I was actually articulating what I was going to write and how to go about it. And the NPR editor reached out to me and said, what do you think about this monkey posting? If you were to write about it, how would you approach it? I said, well, I'm not happy about the way it's being painted as an African disease. So, okay, go for it. And I wrote it. And within two or three days, it was published. I think that's also the privilege of having an established relationship with editors. They know how you write. They trust you. They know your work ethic. They know if they say, okay, we did this thing within two days, you can get it to them. So going back to what my friend Esther Ngumbi told me, you just have to keep writing. She probably has written about 150 op-eds. I'm in awe of her and the ease with which she writes. Thank you, if I any. Your fluency on social media is truly inspiring the way in which you weave together and weave back to the stories and messages you want to tell is really fantastic. And I've just learned so much from listening to you today. 